Hello, all the friends and neighbors of mine, and welcome to the lecture about the DNA and the genes. My name is Pasi Vilapas, and I'm the biology teacher of the Sotunki Upper Secondary School in the city of Vanta, southern Finland. I have originally recorded this lecture in Finnish. This is why it might happen time to time that the soundtrack doesn't completely match the view. I hope you can get over this minor inconvenience. In this lecture we shall get to know an interesting collection of molecules. This is why it is important to make clear how the concept molecule itself is determined and what are the laws which guide the way how the molecules are formed. Molecules are formed when chemical elements get united. Already a compound where there are only two atoms together is a molecule. The largest of molecules are huge networks consisting of billions of atoms. Luckily, in the compounds which are most characteristic for living things, the actual collection of different chemical elements is quite small. The most common elements are hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon and phosphorus. Also sulfur is important. I'll write it here on my list into the center of the letter O of oxygen. Atoms of chemical elements are social characters. To be social means that they don't enjoy being alone. They prefer uniting together with other atoms. This they do with the help of their so-called valence electrons. The number of valence electrons differs between the different chemical elements. When there are two atoms bonding together, both of the atoms have to invest on this at least one of their valence electrons. One could imagine that they are shaking hands together in a place where the bond is formed. When we draw models of molecules, this shaking of hands is expressed with the so-called bond lines. One of the persons I really know well has invented an excellent memory rule by which the number of the valence electrons is easy to remember. This rule is called Honkp rule. Here the chemical elements are listed in the same order as is the number of their valence electrons. Hydrogen has got only one valence electron, phosphorus has got five. Remember that I draw the letter S inside the letter O. This means that sulfur and oxygen have the same amount of valence electrons, namely two. For example, as two hydrogen atoms unite, forming a hydrogen molecule, they get united with the help of their one and only electron. The water molecule is slightly bigger. One oxygen atom gets united with two atoms of hydrogen. Next, we shall draw a model of carbon dioxide. Carbon has got four valence electrons and each oxygen has got two. The model looks like this. Hydrogen is the simplest element in the whole large universe. Its nucleus consists of only one positive particle, the proton. Because it is the positive member of the hydrogen atom, H plus is an appropriate symbol for it. We could as well call it the nucleus of hydrogen. Because this particle is electronically charged, it is often also called an ion of hydrogen. Hydrogen ion. It might be relieving for you to be mentally prepared to meet this variety of four different names. I personally like to demonstrate the structure of water molecule with a drawing of Mickey Mouse. The face of Mickey Mouse represents oxygen and the ears are hydrogen atoms. As you can see, Mickey Mouse has got its mouth wide open. 
Maybe it is got struck by a molecular surprise. It regularly happens that one or another of the Mickey Mouse's ears decides to take off to meet its friends, as we could imagine. This is very normal, even recommended in the world of water molecules. But there is a price for hydrogen it has to pay for its freedom, and the price it's got to pay with the only electron it's got. After the price has been paid, the water molecule gets divided into two. These both halves of water, the proton H+, and the hydroxide ion OH-, are electronically charged. This is why the hydroxide ion can peacefully trust on the fact that the proton also is to get back. The negative net charge of the hydroxide ion is a powerful attractor. This splicing of the water molecule is called autoprotolysis. The moral of this story is that as you pop into pluses or minuses on any of the molecular models, they only are signs of the atoms having lost or gained some extra electrons or protons. I have drawn a sketch here about the structure of the cell. The outer circle over here is the plasma membrane and the inner circle is the nuclear envelope. With the figure of mine I want to demonstrate what are the most important stages during a gene being active, in other words, gene expression. Here the order of things to take place is called the central dogma of cell biology. All these stages put together is a process where the cells get their tools the so-called proteins. Here, in the nucleus, you can see a helix-shaped molecule, the DNA. The DNA is formed by two adjacent halves, the so-called strands of DNA. It is worth noticing that in the nucleus a gene is active. This is evident because the two strands of DNA have got departed from each other. Proteins are the tools of the cells, and a gene is a sequence of DNA which codes for any of the proteins. This is the way how biologists determine the gene on conceptual level. A gene is a sequence of DNA which is coding for the structure of a protein. I have found it useful to draw this figure as a starter dish for you. We begin our tour of the genes by having a look at the most important stages during a gene being active. If we determine the gene in the preceding way, that it is a sequence of DNA which is coding for the structure of a protein, it is worth noticing a couple of details in the picture. First of all, DNA never is allowed to exit the nucleus. Second, the proteins are always produced outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm. When this is the case, some way must be present to conduct the genetic information from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. And this important role is played by a third member of the family of the cell C's information molecules, the messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is a record an ephemeral copy of a gene. Because it is short-lived, lots of messenger RNAs get constantly produced in the nucleus. This is why the cell doesn't have to worry for them too much. No matter if it loses some of them or if the messenger RNA gets damaged. The important basics for you to understand at this point is that the three stages of gene expression take place in the order I explained. The first stage is the DNA. The second stage is the messenger RNA molecule. And the third stage is the protein. Next we are going to have a closer look at the structural characteristics of the molecules I have mentioned. 
what are the structural units of the molecules, how do these units get connected, and how do the molecules work together to make the cells alive. As we already know, the proteins are the tools of the living cells. It may sound a little bit abstract to say so, but if we list some familiar examples of the proteins, it doesn't sound so very abstract anymore. Think about, for example, the digestive enzymes of the gut, contractile fibers of the muscle cells, hemoglobin carrying oxygen in the red blood cells, antibodies which fight against microbes, nervous transmitters, hormones like insulin, The proteins are made of amino acids. In fact, the proteins are chains of amino acids. And because they are chains, they are originally long and narrow strand-shaped molecules. But what are the amino acids? How do they make chains? These are the questions which do need to be explained. Each individual amino acid contains a central carbon atom. Some specific additions are attached to the central carbon atom. These are the amino group NH2, carboxyl group COOH, a side chain and an atom of hydrogen. Twenty different versions of the side chain are known to exist. This particular amino acid over here has got CH3 as its side chain. But it could as well be any of the other 19 different versions. Luckily, all the other parts of the amino acids always stay constant. In conclusion, there are 20 different amino acids and they can be identified according to the structure of their side chain. Hence, an amino acid could be determined in the following way. It is a molecule which has got a central carbon atom, an amino group, a carboxyl group and an atom of hydrogen and a side chain. By the way, the elderly members of the family can very easily be transported from the point A to the point B, and even further, in a car box. Amino acids do make chains with each other. This is how proteins, the tools of the cell, are produced. But how do the amino acids connect to each other? We can easily demonstrate the nature of the rather complicated structure of amino acids with a simpler model. If the amino acid were a lady, then the side chain could be a dress. The amino and the carboxyl group could serve as hands, and the head would represent the hydrogen atom pointing upwards. The bond which unites two neighboring amino acids is called the peptid bond. For the peptid bond to get formed, the amino group of one and the carboxyl group of another amino acid are needed. The actual site of the bond is between the nitrogen and the carbon atom. As the peptid bond is formed, a water molecule is released. And water is always useful for the cells. If you think about the situation during the moment when the water molecule gets released, you can see how both of the elements, the nitrogen over here and the carbon atom over here, suddenly gain a spare valence electron. These kinds of loose electrons are not preferred in the world of molecules. The peptid bond is formed as a natural solution to the problem. As we have seen, it is very easy to demonstrate the nature of the amino acids with the amino acid lady model. There are amino acids with different kinds of dresses on them. In the same manner, also the proteins are just chains of different lengths and shapes of dresses. 
Because they are chains, they are originally long and narrow strands of molecules. Let's think about an amino acid which begins to get other amino acids to attach to it. The chain is short in the beginning, but step by step it will become longer. In order to be able to fulfill their tasks, the proteins need to be bent and folded. Luckily, as the amino acid chain gets lengthened, it also immediately begins to get curved and bent. The ultimate shape of it is determined by the role it is planned to do in the living cell. If the protein is going to be an antibody, a Y-shaped fork is needed to form. But what is the most important detail of all this is that the same order of amino acids in the chain always results to the same three-dimensional appearance. It is important that the proteins bend in an exact manner. The shapes, namely, are crucial for the same reason as are the shapes of car repairing tools. The jaws of biological spanners are called the active centers of the proteins. Only 20 different kinds of amino acids are found in the living cells. But the very small variety of amino acids is capable of producing a practically endless variety of different kinds of sequences of them. Some of the nervous transmitters are made only of one or two amino acids. In the largest of the protein molecules, tens of thousands of amino acids can be found. And although two different kinds of proteins might be of the same length, still the order of the amino acids in them can be different. With a small variety of different alphabets, you and me are able to express an endless variety of different thoughts and ideas. The same applies to the language of life. With a small variety of different kinds of amino acids, the cells are capable of producing a practically endless variety of different three-dimensional structures of proteins. It is central for you to understand that the way the protein is folded is determined completely by the succession of its amino acids. The same amino acid sequence always produces the same three-dimensional protein structure. It also is important to notice that the protein structure often changes dramatically by any of the amino acids missing or being replaced by another. These kinds of changes result when the genes become mutated. What could possibly be the place where the orders for all the useful amino acid sequences could be stored? This place, of course, is the DNA, and they're the special sequences of DNA, which we call genes. The DNA is a storage of information in the same way as the hard plate of a computer can be storing, for example, sound files. The hard plate and the files, though, are not at all the sound. They express themselves with sound only if the information gets played. If the sound gets played, it might have also influences to the surroundings. Emotional music, for example, can even make us cry. The same applies to the genes and proteins. The genes contain information about effective protein structures. But the genetic information needs to be played by the machinery of the cells. Only after the information is used to produce protein, the effects of the proteins do take place. The effects are the processes we identify as life. The DNA doesn't do anything, nor does it exit the nucleus. But the proteins are the executing molecules of living things, and they are produced according to the information served by the genes. 
The proteins are exceptionally specialized tools in the cells. If the cell is in a need of doing a specific job, job number one, for example, a protein number one needs to be produced. The production is possible only if the gene number one becomes activated. If, instead, a job number two needs to get done, the protein number two needs to be produced, and the production is possible by activating the gene number two. Each protein is capable of doing only one very specialized job and then not anything else. Because in the human body there are approximately 25,000 different jobs that need to be done constantly, there must be 25,000 different proteins and the same amount of different genes responsible for the whole network of reactions. Keep on mind at the same time that this is only the amount of different kinds of proteins. Already in just a single red blood cell exists as many as a million copies of the protein hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is only one of the proteins found in the red blood cells. The grammar of life is simple and comprehensible. To demonstrate this I have already made a table. On the left column the grammar of life is presented, on the right column the grammar of literature. The lowest level in literature are the alphabets. Amino acids are the alphabets of life. The next level in literature are the words and sentences. Rows of amino acids are the words and sentences of life. The third level in literature are the books, collections of effective sentences. The equivalent level of life are the organisms, collections of effective proteins. Both of the information systems also have a strong potential of development. They are not static and the development is crucial for their survival. You will be capable of understanding the molecular basis of biological evolution at the same time you understand the nature of the gene. DNA is a chain of nucleotides. If DNA is determined like this, two extra questions are about to arise. What is a nucleotide and how do they then form chains? A nucleotide contains three smaller units. These units are molecules namely sugar, phosphate and a base. Phosphate is an atom of phosphorus which is oxidized. DNA is built in cells by a specialized protein called DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase uses nucleotides as building blocks for the DNA. The nucleotides unite with each other so that the sugar molecule of one nucleotide joins the phosphate molecule of another. This is how the DNA molecules are produced and how they achieve their characteristic comb resembling shape. In addition to this, the nucleotides bond together also with their base sections. In this case, the resulting molecule gets a shape of a ladder. The other half of the ladder is called a single-stranded DNA. When the halves are put together, the resulting molecule is double-stranded DNA. Always when the double-stranded DNA is formed, the base pairing is accomplished according to a specific rule. This is called the DNA-DNA base pairing rule. And it goes like this. Each specific pair of bases is either AT or GC. This means in practice that if one knows the bases on one half of the ladder, one can easily interpret the base sequence of the other side as well. Abbreviations A, 
T, C, and G are the first letters of words adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. It might be difficult to remember the exact pace-bearing rule at the first sight, but it is easy to notice what is the main idea in this. The opposing strands of DNA are like mirror images to each other. The base sequence on the other half reveals the sequence on the other. The opposing strands of base sequences are complementary. It is in fact very easy to remember that C and G form a base pair. Both of the letters resemble a crescent. And of course then the remaining bases A and T form pairs with each other in such case. As we already saw, the base pairs are able to separate from each other. This is what happens at the points where the genes are active. In these places, the DNA opens into two single-stranded molecules. If a gene later becomes deactivated, the two single-stranded molecules meet each other again. A double-stranded molecule of DNA assumes its original form. There is also another kind of molecule with a nucleotide structure in cells. And this is called the RNA. The differences between DNA and RNA are small indeed. In DNA the sugar is deoxyribose. In RNA the sugar is ribose. The bases of DNA are adenine, thymine, guanine and cytosine. RNA doesn't have thymine, instead it has a base called uracil. The other bases in RNA are the same as in DNA. As one could expect, also the RNA always is found either in the single-stranded or the double-stranded form. And when the double-stranded form is being made, there is again a base pairing rule guiding the process. The RNA-RNA base pairing rule goes like this. A, U and C, G. Please have a look at the rule in our three-dimensional model in the second life as well. Interesting news might still be that it also is possible for the DNA and RNA to form double-stranded versions where the other strand is made of RNA and the opposing strand of DNA nucleotides. When this is the case, a DNA-RNA base pairing rule is observed. It is A-U-T-A-G-C and C-G, where the DNA bases are on the left and the RNA base is on the right. This base pairing rule is easy to remember by a new memory rule. Once again by a person who I know very well. The apes understand that all the gorillas sing. The apes understand A-U that all T-A gorillas sing G-C. It is now time to have a closer look at the central dogma of cell biology. Here in the nucleus a gene is active. DNA is opened so that two single-stranded chains of the molecule have appeared. According to the other half of the DNA a messenger RNA is formed. It means that the original molecule is DNA and the resulting copy is RNA. Here the DNA-RNA base pairing rule is applied. There is a special protein able to follow the rule. The protein is called RNA polymerase. Base by base it seems to be sniffing through the whole length of the DNA sequence. And always when it finds a specific base on the DNA it attaches to it the appropriate RNA nucleotide. 
When the whole length of the gene has got carefully copied, the result is a messenger RNA molecule. It is now containing a mirror image of the original DNA base sequence. Messenger RNA slides to the cytoplasm through the pores in the nuclear envelope. Now the ribosomes get attached to the messenger RNA. The ribosomes alone are not able to interpret the code of the messenger RNA. They need some help from a class of molecules called the transfer RNAs. The transfer RNA molecules are needed to guide the amino acid molecules to the ribosomes. The ribosomes serve as docking points for the transfer RNA molecules. This is a very central role during the last stage of the protein synthesis. The transfer RNA molecules are just the regular nucleotide structured RNA molecules. Still, they differ from the messenger RNA molecules with their slightly exceptional shape. They contain loops. In our three-dimensional model, here in the second life, the loops are represented by the different colors of the shirts on the gentleman. One of the loops has got three successive bases pointing down. This combination of the three outwards pointing bases varies among the transfer RNA molecules. There namely are 20 different combinations of bases. Note that 20 is also the number of the different kinds of amino acids. In the drawing, which I will show you next, and in the 3D model around here in the second life, I try to demonstrate the nature of the transfer RNAs and the amino acids with an analogy of ladies and gentlemen. The transfer RNA molecules are gentlemen and they carry amino acid ladies on their shoulders. The model is slightly unconventional, but it demonstrates well the main idea of translation. And what's the best, it is easy to remember. A funny detail is that in Finland we have a traditional wife-carrying contest in a place called Songajärvi every summer. It is not only the speed that matters in the contest. If at the other end of the transfer RNA molecule a base sequence is pointing out, the amino acid attaching site is at the opposing end. For each different three base combination found in transfer RNA molecules, there is a reserve of a single specific version of the amino acids. This resembles the pair bonds between real-life men and women. Not everybody fits for everybody. The scientific conclusion is that three successive bases can be interpreted as a specific class of the amino acids. This picture represents the good old central dogma of cell biology. The approach only is slightly more detailed than in the previous one. Here again we see the plasma membrane, and here is the nuclear envelope. In the nucleus we can see the DNA which has got opened on the length of an active gene. The DNA is opened almost like a zipper, so that the bases can easily be checked by the RNA polymerase. I have drawn a magnifying lens this red thing over here, as a symbol for the RNA polymerase. And as we can see, a messenger RNA molecule is getting composed over here. Easily we can notice that the DNA-RNA base pairing rule is being used. A unites with U, T with A, G with C, and vice versa. Apes understand that all the gorillas sing. Because both, the original strand of DNA and the messenger RNA molecule consist of nucleotides, the molecular structure during this kind of a replication stays very much the same. The process could be compared with a change in one's handwriting. 
This is why this stage of the gene expression is called transcription and the resulting messenger RNA a transcript, written again. The raw material for this, the individual nucleotides found here in the nucleus, we achieve by eating other innocent items of nature, such as carrots and perch fish. From the digestive tract, these building blocks are transported to the cells by the blood, and in the cells they ultimately end into the nucleus. Base by base, the genetic code is getting rewritten and the resulting RNA molecule is to contain the same information as its DNA template. Only it now is a mirror image of the original. After this, the messenger RNA exits the nucleus to the cytoplasm and a ribosome gets attached to its other end. I have drawn here a couple of dots to remind us about the fact that the complete length of the messenger RNA is not drawn on this presentation. When an amino acid meets its correct transfer RNA counterpart, it attaches to it. Together they begin their journey towards the ribosomes. At the same time, the ribosome is attaching to a messenger RNA molecule. The ribosomes are of a specific size. In the picture and in the second life model, you can see that the width of a ribosome covers six nucleotides on the messenger RNA. Exactly two transfer RNA molecules can get attached to it at a time. As two couples of ladies and gentlemen attach to the messenger RNA, the ribosome creates a chemical bond between the adjacent amino acid ladies. We have already learned that this bond is called peptide bond and it is formed between the amino and the carboxyl group. In this picture and in the 3D model here in the second life, the way how the peptide bond is formed is demonstrated here slightly above the messenger RNA molecule. As the peptide bond is formed, a water molecule is released and as we already know, water is always useful for the cells. As one could expect, there is again a pace-bearing rule guiding the process. As the transfer RNA molecules attach to the strand of the messenger RNA, this naturally happens according to the RNA-RNA base-pairing rule. It goes like this. A, U, G, C. Apes understand, gorillas sing. Please go and have a look at the rule, also here in the second life in our 3D model of the gene. As the translation now has begun, with the first two couples of ladies and gentlemen, the ribosome slides forward along the messenger RNA. The movement it makes at the time is exactly three bases long. Now a third couple, a lady carried by a gentleman, is able to attach to the messenger. Soon also this, the most recently arrived lady, finds herself attached to the chain of the others. The oldest of the transfer RNA gentlemen always gets replaced by the younger ones as the newcomers settle down to the reading frame of the ribosome. To be able to offer space for only one newcomer at a time, the ribosome always has to proceed on the messenger RNA by steps of exactly three bases. Each set of three bases found on the messenger RNA is called a codon. The three bases on each of the transfer RNA gentlemen in turn is called an anticodon. The transfer RNA gentlemen repeatedly return to the cytoplasm each time they get released from their earlier amino acid ladies. There they attach to new ladies and the cycle gets started again. Codon by codon, the ribosome slides over the whole length of the messenger RNA molecule. When the task is fulfilled, a complete chain of amino acids gets finished. The messenger RNA gets released from the ribosome. The same is the case of the protein. It is time for it to begin its important job in the cell. Because during this latter part of gene expression, 
a sequence of nucleotides is interpreted to a sequence of amino acids. The stage is called translation. Now the change in the molecular structure is radical. The language gets completely transformed. Translation is an excellent word for crystallizing this fact. One might begin to wonder from where do the transfer RNA gentlemen appear to the cells? There is a set of genes in the DNA which code for them. The products of these genes are not translated to proteins. The transfer RNA is the only and the ultimate gene product. On this basis, we are now ready to learn an alternative determination for the concept of gene. Gene is a sequence of DNA which is coding for a molecule of RNA. Gene is a sequence of DNA which is coding for a molecule of RNA.